All right, so I've got a feeling a lot of people here have an idea of who you are, your company, and stuff like that. However, before we go into the deep dive on the first kind of th things you've learned and all that, why don't you give everybody a little bit about your background, who you are, and what led you to doing what you do today? So I grew up in southeastern Kentucky. I know I don't have the accent at least as much anymore. If I keep drinking these, it'll come back. But the... Uh, <laughs> My wife says a couple of bourbons and she doesn't recognize me anymore. But I grew up in Appalachia and you know came to love the outdoors through growing up there. I was kind of the last of the pre-internet children. We didn't know what existed outside of those mountains, so I spent a lot of time outside. And went to University of Kentucky, got into uh, journalism, and I know that's exactly what everybody thought the tech CEO uh, had a degree in. You're right. Uh, I, I spent years doing that. Um, I, I founded a wedding photo agency out of college. Uh, I, w I worked as a uh, photojournalist for a while. Um, and, and this is like right after the Great Recession, so journalism was kind of on its way down. And uh, it, it became really tough, so I pivoted into advertising. I did that for a while as a social media manager, or I don't remember what the title was, but managing social media accounts. And uh, I did PR. I got fired for a side hustle, which is a fun story. It happened a couple blocks from here, actually, with Zach over here. Uh, so that's a fun one that we might get into in Q&A if some of you are wondering about telling your bosses about your side hustle. Um, I've been there. Uh, my next job, I, I loved, and I worked for five years at a, a, an agency and ended up working my way up from writing about toilets. I did. Uh, wrote about toilets for... Uh, a little while and then kind of small agencies the nice thing is you can you really rise to the ranks became creative director um, that was my second company working with Donovan my co-founder here and then had this idea for the platform that we built today so we started go wild while I was still working in advertising I did that I stayed for like almost two years while I worked on the side we actually had an app in the app store and I was still doing it as a side hustle um, so today I'll just fast forward because there's a lot of I've, we've pivoted like two or three times now. Uh, we're in a good spot though, Patrick. Things are great. Uh, uh, Pat, Render, Render Capital is our investor. Uh, but today, <laughs> that's right. Uh, today we are a social commerce platform for outdoor enthusiasts. We empower people to share their story freely. A lot of you don't know this because you're, you're not a hunter and angler, but it's really, um, you know, you get put in Facebook jail for talking about hunting these days. So we give people a place to talk about that stuff, but also there's a reward system. If you're familiar with Reddit, we have something very similar to Reddit Karma. As you unlock Karma points, you get deals, you get free t-shirts, you get all kinds of cool stuff as a reward in the system. So that's effectively what it is today. We can go on more in detail as we ask questions, but we're a social commerce platform. Awesome. So one of the things you shared, you weren't just a journalism major, but you are an award-winning journalist, right? So you're not just a journalist. Yeah. 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 It, I came out of college <laughs> thinking I was going to have like an easy ride into a good gig, and I ended up taking like a full-time contract position, which means they didn't want to give me health insurance. <laughs> uh, those employers yeah. just trying to, oh yeah. my goodness. All right. So, well, thank you for that background. So Let's talk a little bit about the impact that COVID specifically had on your business. So you guys were going down a certain path and things seemed to be very clear and then COVID happened. So talk to us about that pivot and just some other things you've been forced to do and some of the key lessons you've learned along the way. Um, so January is our trade show season, and 2020, Jacob and I fly into, Jacob Knight's here with my team. Uh, he's our head of business development. Now he's pivoted too with his title, because pivots. Um, but he and I go to the largest industry show in Vegas. We're closing deals left and right. I mean, we are like hitting the bar hard after the show because we're so excited about everything that we're, we're getting, you know, big deals from big brands that even if you're not in our industry, you would recognize. And we basically in our pipeline out of that trip thought we had our year made and it compounded again with a, a, another show and things are piling up. We've got pilots that are worth like, you know, 10% of our revenue projections for the year. We're on top of the world and we're raising money. We, um, we had extended our funding round with an investor to raise from January, 2020 to March. Um, and then, you know, we were supposed to close at the end of March and, um, no fault to the investors, the market just shifted and they couldn't liquidate. And so uh, every time I got a call from the investors, we were losing 100 grand, 200 grand. 
And, you know, I, we really went into a little bit of panic mode. Uh, I'm, probably some of the people at the table over here didn't know if they were working with us. Uh, actually, Braden is the weirdo that was like, yeah, it's a pandemic. I'm going to start for a new company. It's a startup. And, you know, they're just barely able to finish this funding round. So Braden joined us in like April of 2020. Um, still with us. Uh, but everything was falling apart. And advertisers are calling us and telling like, hey, I know we just committed to this, but I need out. And we're letting people out of signed agreements. And... Um, effectively, our model was to advertise. So, you know, we, we have this really effective way to, Lisa's heard this pitch from back in the day, right? That's like what we were planning on doing was advertising because it's not allowed on Facebook. You know, they had no other option. And so we, we had what we th felt like was the best gig in the house. Like nobody else could do what we did. And COVID hit, everybody lost their advertising budgets. Our contacts were fired or laid off or whatever. Um, and then we go for... 90 days been like no it's okay it's fine you know everything's fine the house is burning in the background it's like the elmo uh you know meme uh, but then there were a lot of moments of us sitting at this conference table in our office that summer and talking about it and it's it's like what can we do to figure this out and we had this moment of realizing that we had this really cool gear feature people love gear in our audience they spend thousands of dollars on it a year if the brands can't afford or don't have budget to advertise anymore, we should sell it. Um, so we went with that. And I think we built from, from August of 2020, we started building social commerce, what, what we now have as a, as a product uh, where you can interact with gear socially. So if, if just for example, if you know, Patrick tags the, the gear he's using for fishing, that shows up on that product now. So you can actually see that product in the field. Nobody's doing this, it's really freaking cool. Um, and it helps other people see how that product performs. And, and so we launched that from, we built it from August to November and launched it. And I mean, we got like Garmin and there were a lot of big brands that we convinced to bet on us. And since then, uh, it's taken off. We've had ups and downs. I mean, there's been months where we got creamed because of getting kicked off Facebook or whatever, but uh, the pivot, was fantastic. And now, you know, we uh, look at a lot of our metrics and like it, it, it kind of hampered us for a year. But at the end of the day, I think any of my co-founders and they're all here. And if you guys get a chance, uh, we have a data scientist and iOS developer and the best UX designer you'll ever meet. They're all here. You should come talk to them afterwards. Um, but you know, I think all of us would agree. This was the best thing that ever happened to us. We're actually mildly embarrassed. We didn't think of it sooner. Um, but that's, you know, when you're on top of the world, closing deals, you feel like, you know, everything's going right. So we had the rug pulled out from under us, but it, it worked out really well. So you literally took the adversity of COVID and you guys are ultimately better for it. For sure, because we're not, I mean, ad sales suck. I mean, Jacob and I would have told you that while we were doing it. Like, you know, you're constantly trying to make room in somebody's budget that wasn't allocated to you before. And now we're tapping into consumers that are buying this gear with or without us. But if they can get it through a 10%, you know, deal for them or rewards on Go Wild, why would you not do that? Or if I can buy it, we also give 1% of our profits back into a nonprofit that teaches kids to hunt, fish, shoot, all the stuff we love. And so they feel really good about doing that versus Amazon where, you know, you just sent Jeff Bezos to the moon. But like, what did that do for you? You know, it's interesting what you guys are doing from a business model. This morning when I was working out, I was listening to a podcast and it was from the founder of Mighty Networks. And they were talking. Gina. Yeah, exactly about what you guys are doing here and how social media, it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves and where that goes. Because more and more people are turning to platforms like what you all have built, where it's community baked in. And as you said, you can see the products and people doing it. So are you finding that more of your target audience, people are flocking to you all because it's a like-mindedness, they can connect with other people and not just the products and things like that, but why are people ultimately coming and doing business with you all at Go Wild? People, the, the, the social commerce is cool. Like our audience buys more gear than you guys can imagine. The average hunter spends $2,800 $2, a year on hunting. It's insane. Like cyclists, like a lot of the big spending hobbies you have in your head don't compare to this audience. So that's all cool, but that's not why they come to us. They come to us because, um, you know, it's interesting, and I'm not going to get political, don't freak out, but it's interesting that we're in this landscape where people are really concerned that a billionaire just bought Twitter and what's he going to do with it? And I guess you can buy your way to the truth. And I'm seeing all this debate, but for our audience, we're already seeing the results of billionaires deciding what we're allowed to talk about. And I'm not talking about politics. A lot of this stuff is, you know, um, things that fund conservation. You know, hunting 
is a fantastic act. It, it is how we pay for wildlife management in this state. It's how we pay for it in this country. And when you buy fishing gear, you are funding the biologists who study that fish, those crawdads in the, in the streams. So it's, it's really misunderstood. And the Bay Area, which creates these rules around this stuff, does not understand it. And it gets lumped in with things that it shouldn't. And so they, they get put in Facebook jail for talking about what they did on the weekend. And I, I have plenty of friends that have been kicked off of Instagram. They've had their Facebook groups deleted. This is all stuff that's legal. It's stuff that funds conservation. So they come to us because they're like, oh my God, literally I, I, everybody that joins Go Wild gets a, a, a message. You all should check it out just to see like the platform that you're hearing about. You get a message from me and one of the most common responses is, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to find a platform where I'm not gonna be harassed for doing what I grew up doing, you know? Um, and you know, I'm not saying I agree with all hunters, but by, by far, um, what we are supporting is as old as mankind. So that's, that's the first thing they recognize. You know, taking your lifestyle away is far more important than finding $5 off of fishing lures. Awesome. Uh, it's going to be exciting to see how this grows because the audience you're serving is huge. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. So I want to back up a little bit when you were sharing a little bit of your story of when you were working elsewhere and you had your side hustle and stuff like that. How did you know when it was time to go full time? You were a little bit forced into it because you were let go of your duties, I think. First but time. The, it was the first time. The so first the second, time. Okay. Second time I had more of this. Okay. This got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> so how did you know it was time? What was that thing where you really felt that sense that, okay, this is going to be something that I can make a go at? This is, um, I, I asked uh, one of our investors one time, Jerry, I said, Jerry, how am I going to know? You know, we're raising this money. I think we raised $450,000 in that first round. And I still didn't know if I should quit my job. Because if, if anybody, how many of you all have raised money and know what I'm talking about here? I can't, I, everybody's like, I, they don't want anybody to know they're raising. Uh, <laughs> so this is what's wrong with Kentucky is no one's like out there talking about it. Everybody's keeping their cards to their chest. I'm just kidding. Uh, but the, um, you know, if you've done this, you, you've, like that first round is tough because you really, you're trying to figure out uh, what that burn's going to be, how long you can last on the money. And half a million dollars is really hard to do in Kentucky on that first round. You know, there's a lot of resources here that didn't exist when we started. Um, that or I was definitely living in the dark. I'm pretty sure things have changed a lot since 2016, uh, though. Um, we started raising money in 17. But, the, you know, Jerry told me, he said, you'll just know. And there is like 30 to 40 percent of it is you'll just know. And uh, things will start to line up and it's going to make sense. I always tell people that you really need to look at alternatives though, because it's not just like, it's not the clean break that everybody wants. I, I was at a job that I was happy with and had health insurance and I pretty much a nine to five. I mean, unless we had an RFP, I wasn't working crazy hours. I was very happy with that. And that let me work on my other company in, in the morning or after work. You're not going to get that nice clean break of like, I'm, to, you know, Friday done with my full-time gig going in Monday and I'm going to start like, that's not really what I've, from the founders I've talked to, uh, you know, there's a lot of them in the room that I know that, that are not going through that. And what I would encourage you to do, and this is what happened to me is I ran into one of my old clients who fired us funny enough, but he, uh, uh, he was like, how's it going? And I, I'm talking to him about go wild. And he said, when, and I said, what are you talking about? He said, when are you going full time? I ended up working part time at this insurance tech company here in Louisville because it was my old client and he offered me good money to come work 20 hours a week that supplemented my pay. I think so many people look for making a jump and I got, oh, I'm making 90,000 or 80,000 or 70,000 or whatever you're making and you think you have to fill that out of your burn and it, like, there's so many other things you should be paying besides yourself in the beginning. If you can put in 20 hours with, with another company and get at least like 60% of your salary covered, it goes a long way to get, even I got six months, I had six months to figure it out. And it meant the world to us because it got us to that next funding round and we were raising money again and we had traction and I had confidence. Um, there's, there's honestly like one thing I really disagree with that you'll hear on things like Shark Tank is that you want founders eating ramen noodles and living, you know, that they need to be wearing the same shoes for 10 years and suffering to make it happen. Um, if you've got kids, if you've got mortgages, the worst thing to distract you from your company is worrying about those things, right? So 
don't be stupid. Don't jump into it when you, you, you're going to lose your car or your house or not be able to feed your kids. You do have to figure out how to handle those things. And I quit. I, I walked it, guys. I had, a, I had a kid, and my wife was nine months pregnant when I quit my job. And I said, I, I'm giving you three weeks or until my daughter is born, and I'm out. And, and um, so, so I, I, I've been there. But I think too often people look for that, like, wholesome, full replacement you're not getting a job offer from Humana when you go to your startup. That's not how it works. So, you know, you, you have to be ready for a little bit of chaos. I worked probably, I don't know, at least 80 hours when I was working that 20 hours with the insurance tech company, but it, and it wasn't clean, but it, it was perfect for what I needed. So when somebody's looking for that job, do you, do you have any advice on what kind of jobs to look for? Is it something that may be along the same vein of what they're doing in a similar space, or is it something just completely different to give their mind a break? Do you have any advice on that? I mean, if you can do something that you're going to learn from, that's awesome. But I mean, you have skills that if you can just, I mean, I went to that insurance company and a lot, they didn't have anything. And I'm like, well, I can show up and set up some MailChimp emails and, you know, go hire a designer and like very low level things I knew how to do. Um, and then I basically groomed uh, the designer that I brought in and I hired my replacement. So, um, you know, it was not anything groundbreaking. It was, it was fun. I like my team and everything, that, you know, with the company. And I'm still friends with the founder of that company today. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a means to an end. And I, I would have done landscaping. You know, and no, nothing against landscapers. Like, I actually like landscaping. That didn't mean that's coming off as an insult. But, like, I would have done whatever it took. And I, I think, like, a lot of founders I talk to, there's a little bit of ego at play that you don't want it to seem like you, you know, waited tables to be able to get your startup off the ground. You want it to see, like, you want that momentum. But that, there's a lot of momentum when you, well, I could not believe what it opened up when I quit my job at the agency. You don't realize what you're going to get by working half the hours. Um, you know, immediately filled up. It's not like I was sitting around by the pool, right? Like you're, you're getting that time to, to put into your baby. So you mentioned fundraising, how much things have changed since you all started raising funds in 2017 and things like that. And you and your team have largely been pretty successful raising money here in the Louisville area. So tell us a little bit about some of the changes you've seen and what you believe has helped you all be successful in raising relatively large sums of money here in this market. You got Zach so worked up right now, he just turned his hat around backwards. <laughs> Zach's my co-founder that I raise money with. Uh, he's a president of Go Wild. Um, when we started, I had no idea what I was doing. We, our first valuation came from, that was the point people stopped laughing at me. So I was like, that must be what we're worth. Like I didn't have a lead or any of that stuff. Um, and. Uh, a lot of what I ran into was definitely my ignorance, but I, I, you're going, if you're starting, especially a company like us, like Louisville has a lot of companies that come out of the gate and they generate revenue. And like, that's, at least that's what I, the feedback I get from the investors I talk to, um, you know, healthcare companies, like they, they have a very clear path a lot of times. Yeah, there might be some debt up front or something like that, but they, they were nowhere near the model that we were building, uh, which was basically like lose money for forever until you get acquired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was not that, but it was kind of that in the very beginning. Um, we have a great model now, but it was, you know, we were just making this up as we went. Literally every investor pitch, if you've never done it, you walk into a room, someone tells you that your, your numbers are ridiculous and uh, that your valuation is too high, that they don't like your, your uh, funding vehicle. And, you know, you just take that over and over and over again. So when, when you ask, like, why have you guys been successful from the founders I talked to, um, I think a lot of that is just pure stubbornness and keeping going. I mean, Zach, we've been turned down hundreds of times. The, 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 it is a numbers game. It is pure. It's not that um, Zach and I are the greatest pitchers of all time. I, I very often meet, there's founders in the room that I know right now that have way better pitches than when I pitched Lisa, for God's sake, in 2017. I'm like embarrassed to see her and think about it now. Um, it's not that we were geniuses. It's not that we had prettier decks. It's, it's a lot of it is just people give up because hearing no hurts. And I know that's not like the magic pill a lot of people want to hear, but not taking no, finding the next guy is, is critical. Um, some, some in the weeds advice that I can give um, on this, 
pitch with a co-founder. If you don't have a co-founder, you're already off to a bad start. I, I feel strongly about that. I feel very strongly that if you're in the point where you can still bring somebody else in, do it. I mean, I got three of them with me here because I, I, I needed more compensation than most of you guys probably do. Uh, so the, you know, have people who compliment your weaknesses, pitch with them. Zach and I numerous times, I used to pitch, I pitched the first two rounds by myself. 2019, Zach started pitching with me. That's like by far things took off because I started realizing investors would sometimes resonate with me and he would know to shut up and he would let me talk. A lot of investors are like, man, this data scientist is really smart. I wanna, they're gonna ask him questions, I shut up. I don't, I don't speak nearly as much when they start resonating with Zach. Um, that is a huge thing that I think a lot of people feel like they need to control the pitch, there needs to be one guy. That is, that is not the case. Who, find co-founders and, and watch the room, learn to read the room and know when to shut up. Um, from every pitch I've done, I, I started learning, asking people, who should I be talking to? And you know, I don't do this if somebody's an a-hole and like I want out of there and like I don't, I don't even want their advice, but like for the most part, even if somebody says no, they might say, well, you know what, Patrick over at Render, right? Like they'll refer you to somebody. And if you end every pitch asking that, I've found I usually get two or three leads. So I can turn one into three, and then I turn three into math is hard, okay? So then, uh, you know, the <laughs> I build a spreadsheet of who I've been talking to. I know when I talked to them last. I know what the conversation was. I note that they don't like safes, and I'm never going to talk to them again. <laughs> or whatever it is you know it's like you make notes I, I we have on our active list we have 230 people 230 people that this goes out to we have nowhere near that many investors but i continue to follow up with people so that's the this is the going into the next am i talking too much um the uh <laughs> this this is like if you're a founder though this is the good stuff and it's the stuff that when i talk to founders they're not doing the the monthly to quarterly communication that you don't do is why your funding rounds are hard to get off the ground. <laughs> Patrick's clapping. Uh, louder, my ego needs it. Um, the, uh, no, the, but the investors want to know what you're doing. They want to see the momentum. You know, the, uh, I've had multiple, multiple, multiple investors who said no in 2017. They said no in 2018 and they invest in 2019 because they watched every month and I sent every month for a long time. I just quit doing monthly last year um, I went to quarterly because it's exhausting, but when you're grinding, that's what you have to do. Um, send updates and talk about things so that investors can see the progress. When you show up at their door and you got one meeting and they never hear from you again, you basically prove that you're flaky and they shouldn't invest in you. A lot of people do not think of this. They think it's some magic pitch. You come in, you wow them, and they're going to give you money. And that, that's just not how it works. And so it's not that, I, again, I want to reinforce, like, I, I don't think that it's anything that we do in particular. I don't think we have, you know, I mean, our pitch decks are pretty, but nobody, nobody invests just because of that, right? Like nobody invests just because Dak, Zach is, you know, the, the, the data scientist, right? It's all these things working together, but more than anything, I'm telling you it's communication and it's not giving up and just reworking that model I just talked about. So I'm gonna summarize that. Cause again, I talked a lot there. Um, a lot of cold reach out, you get a meeting, you ask who you should be talking to regardless. If they invest in you, you'll turn that three number becomes 10, right? Because nobody wants to give you money and then see you not get your goal. So all of a sudden that, they should have plenty of other people. You take all those names down, you repeat that process. And as you, as, when you finish a meeting, you say, I'm gonna add you into my CRM. I wanna put you into my MailChimp and you'll hear from me once a month or once a quarter. And you update them as you said you would. If I said you were gonna get an email on the end of the month for, I don't know, four years, I send an every email, vacation, no matter what, I would sit down and send that email and they knew that I was consistent. I was someone they could depend on. And they can see the chart. They can see that since they've been, like I've had a lot of people come back. I had a guy literally message me on LinkedIn the other day and say he regrets not investing because they've seen the, 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 the growth and the trajectory. So it, it, it is more of a process than it is anything special that we done, we've done. I think too many people give up and they don't just continue to repeat that follow through. Um, if I were to say anything in addition to that, um, just, just on the fundraising note, FOMO is the best thing in the world for investors. If I raise, let's say I'm raising $2 million. If I get half a million, I go tell Adam, Hey man, I raised half a million already. It's been three days. <laughs> Sounds obnoxious, but I'm, it's like Adam gives me 250. I'm like, Hey Patrick, guess what, man? I raised $750,000. It's only been a week. He gives me, he, he gives me like a maybe I go over here to Zach. I'm like, Zach, dude, 
I'm, I'm like days from getting that million dollars closed. We've already got 750 confirmed. You just keep it rolling forward. And that tactic works really well. Nobody wants to miss the boat, especially if they've been watching and know that, that. Um, we raised, this is a gross, uh, uh, I almost don't want to say it, but like just as proof of the pudding, um, I had been hyping us up. We got into this accelerator and I'm like, hey, we're going to raise a round. And this, this demo day has been known to close out rounds really fast. We opened the round a week before demo day and we raised $850,000 in five days because of FOMO. So that's another effective tactic to kind of roll into what I'm talking about. So first of all, I don't think you talk too much. There's a lot of wisdom here that a lot of people can take to what they're doing and it's very applicable. So thank you for sharing all that because that's the real world stuff and you love to share this information and you can tell when you speak you're doing it because you genuinely care. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But no is hard, especially if it's something you care about and that you're deeply invested in and that you want to see succeed. So what motivated you and Zach to keep going in spite of all those no's? What was the why that kept you churning ahead when a lot of other po people would have quit? What kept you in the game? Probably ego. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't want the shame of, uh, like, I got people working for us, man. Like, I mean, that, like, I really like that keeps me up at night. Um, at, at this point, especially, it's one thing in the beginning when you got your full-time gig and you're raising money on the side, you're screwing a lot of stuff up and that's okay. Um, and I, I worked really hard at that period, but I mean, the weight of it was different. You know, it's, um, there's different phases of, of a startup. And, uh, at this point, man, I don't want to be the guy that, you know, my, my, uh, my blog's called like how to blow $6 million. You know, it's like, that would, that's a horrible legacy to have hanging around your head. I mean, and it, it may go that way, you know, two years, maybe I'll come back and that'll be like the, the title of the event, uh, how to have fun blowing 6 million. But like, I don't want to be that guy. And so I, Zach and I, um, are super frugal in everything that we do. Dan makes fun. My teammate Dan's here today and he makes fun of us because, uh, literally, literally it came out of Zach's mouth today of like, we have this subscription that's a dollar and I know it's only a dollar a month but we have to figure out if we want to keep that or not. Like we pinch pennies, man. Um, and I don't, I just don't want to be the guy that screwed that, like have that hanging around my head. That does come to mind like as a part of that. The other part of it though is um, I have people who tell me that this is the best job they've ever had, that they love doing what they do. And um, as much as I don't want my legacy to be that, like I don't want to screw that up for other people. Um, and, and then there's like also the fact that you raised all this money from these people that are, gonna be very unhappy with you and you'll never get another dime from them again. There's that. But like the two first things, like my legacy and not screwing it up for our team is really important to me. Got it. All right, so since you brought up mistakes that cost money, certainly you've made a mistake or two along the way, raising funds, bringing folks on. Is there anything that stands out in that process, both technically or tactically, where you've done where you just weren't aware of something that is hurt because you didn't know it cost you maybe more than a dollar, maybe two? Uh, I've screwed up a lot of stuff and I'm uh, almost embarrassed in front of investors to say how much some of these mistakes have cost us. Um, anybody like super early founder that's not raised money yet? We got a couple here. Um, read venture deals like tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, seriously, it's like, I, it would have saved me 10 grand in legal fees. Um, I had an attorney who said he was a startup attorney. I believed him, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I literally started all this with Googling how to raise money for an idea, like I was that dumb. Uh, but you know, I, I read a lot of books, I try to research and learn, and that was one book that I found out about in 2019, and I started reading it. I think I started reading that book, uh, we were in this accelerator that summer, and so are going into summer and I started reading about it and there's this thing called the 83B election. And if you don't know what that is, uh, that's not good. So again, venture deals. Uh, but it basically it says that your shares, you know, you price shares at a low amount or nothing because the company is worth nothing. If you don't do this, when your co-founders start to, uh, their, their options start to vest, there's a taxable event that happens. And so I found out about this the hard way. It cost me $10,000 and I didn't sleep for a week. I swear to God, I did not sleep for a week. My attorney told me two days, I fired the old attorney and, uh, for something else. And, and then the new attorney is going through paperwork and he's like, so there's this weird thing that I think we should talk about. 
and he tells me this and I'm like when did this happen he's like yeah it's two days ago like it literally I missed the deadline by two days and it took it took us about I think like 10 grand over time to undo this mistake and convert these shares and and now we have this Patrick's familiar with my cap table I have this like awkward LLC that can't go away because uh, of this problem so it's like even rolling forward I'm still dealing with explaining why we have an ink and LLC um, so don't do that uh, read venture deals um, along the way though there's there's like uh, you know um, I'm trying to think of other th things I, I wish I had researched more of like the LLC versus Inc. because it felt really dumb to be like, oh yeah, we need to be an Inc. actually for our type of company. Like, I think that's something that gets skipped over. LLC is a great way to start if you have no idea what you're doing. But um, venture deals, again, all that's answered. Um, and then just in general, hiring a good attorney. I cannot overstate this. Um, I'm on my third attorney so far, but he's been with us since 2018 or 20, 20, 20 I don't remember. Um, and the things that he catches that would have cost us ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars to get out of. Like you don't realize how fast these fees rack up, and also how much pain they cause you or investors. That's the other thing. Um, you know, down the road stuff compounds and rolls forward, and it can be really painful. I have to go back to people you raise money from to fix. So, just good attorneys, good attorneys, read venture deals, and hire good attorneys or attorney. So obviously surrounding yourself with the right attorney, the right accountant advisors is just critical. So you made some mistakes. It sounds like early on with those folks, what would you say to folks if they're just getting started, they're looking to hire the right attorney, the right advisor to help them. How do they go about doing that to maybe avoid some of the mistakes that you made that cost you a good bit of money there? Talk to other founders. Um, most most people that are startups are already rolling with it. They they have attorneys they recommend. Talk to people like Patrick and Lisa. I think I see Kelby back there. And uh, you know all these people know the good attorneys in the state. But it's also post 2020. You can my attorney lives in New York. I think I don't even really know because he's always like he was in Orlando and now he's in New York. I don't know. I don't care. Uh, it does not matter. The 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 paperwork's all the same when they pull it up on the screen. So. Um, just ask people, get referrals, and then even if my, I don't know, you know, I can refer you to somebody else in town, like uh, Fort Phelps in town, was somebody we talked to and liked, and um, and and ended up not working with them because it was a weird story. Uh, my attorney quit and then came back, so I took him back. Uh, but but I loved Nathan over at Fort Phelps, so like there's a lot of great attorneys here in town that you can find. Um, but just talk to other people. All right, so want to go into the next thing. One of the things that I love when you're sharing all this stuff, Brad, is that you are a person who's in the thick of it, that has raised money, you're pivoting, so you're a person that loves sharing the actual journey itself. You know, you've got so many consultants and people and things like that that know the stuff or in the space that may or may not actually be going through and doing it. And with you coming in from that perspective, actually doing it, you speak with so much authority because you've got these experiences and things like that. So I just make up a good portion you, of it. Say it with confidence and everybody you just make rolls stuff with stuff up. Speak with confidence. All right. Well, I don't think any of us are quite buying that, but we're good. So tell me a little bit. So when we talked a few weeks ago, you were sharing with me that you love helping mentor, coach, advise other founders and what they're going through. So tell me a little bit about how you're doing that. You're obviously very busy, a lot on your plate, but you still carve out a little bit of time to serve founders coming up. So tell us a little bit about that. So admittedly, um, at stuff like this, our team has not been as involved as we would like to be. Uh, I can't, somebody mentioned the other day, I was just joking about, with my team about it. They're like, I never see you guys at any of the startup events. And there, there's a lot of good reason that like, I got three kids, my wife works night shift, it's tough. Um, I have to get like, you know, a, a, a Congress approval to get to do stuff to make sure that like the kids are, you can't just leave kids at home, right? Um, but then I was making, I was making fun of uh, my team because we, we, even when we come to something like this, like they're all clustered over here, not networking with anybody. Um, but we, we do try to help. Zach, Zach does a great job of this. Chris talks to a lot of people. Um, and, and one thing I've started doing is uh, I used to get like a lot of inquiries um, and it was just randomly on LinkedIn of people asking and it gets tough because, you know, if you're not careful, time is my greatest asset to get stuff done. And if you're not careful, like even out of the goodness of your heart, you can still kill like eight hours a month uh, of those kind of meetings. So like I kind of learned some lessons in not doing that. Um, and also I learned uh, to qualify better if who I was meeting because you get in some meetings, you're like, what are we 
what is happening right now? And then, or, or are they like, at the end of it, they're like, so I have a product I'd like to tell you about. <laughs> uh, so I, I have almost a blanket hard rule now of like, I just really don't take a lot of outside meetings. I focus on my company. But to replace the eight hours, what I've done is I have a, it's not a, it's like a, I guess it's a, it's not a company or anything. It's just a thing I do like founder fires where we can sit down. It's kind of like this. You can just talk to somebody and I don't think that I'm the smartest guy in the room. Like I'm not even the smartest guy in our, our team, probably on like lower totem pole on that ranking. Uh, but there, there is something to asking somebody that's done it. And the hardest thing, like I didn't know anybody that had done it when I first started. Um, so my first pitches were terrible. Uh, I, again, I told you I made up my valuations in the beginning. I, I tried to do my own paperwork. I was that stupid. Like I just, there's a lot of mistakes I've made and I get a lot out of telling people what I did wrong. You know, if I can stop somebody else from $10,000 in legal fees because of a stupid document you need to file with the government, you know, uh, that's, that's worth that time. So founder fires is this, uh, it's actually really cool. I've done like five of these so far, five or six. Um, I do it once a month. I sit down with somebody for 90 minutes and I usually show up with a page of notes on their pitch deck. I try to find really early stage companies, um, mostly because that's where I've been. Like if you want to talk about M and A, I don't know, I'm not your guy. Um, but for anything that's basically pre where we are, you know, I've done that and I meet a lot of founders who don't know how to divide up founder equity. That's, you know, it's all the time. People are like, Hey, I have three co-founders and I don't know what to do with the equity here. Um, you know, they don't know uh, what everybody, all the investors, the angel investors in Kentucky love convertible debt. And I'll usually try to talk them out of it and then tell them about a safe and they don't know about it because the investors don't tell them about safes because they hate safes. Um, you know, so if I can kind of help people experience, especially outside of this ecosystem, you know, we've raised money all across the country now. We've been in an accelerator that had global impact. Um, and if I can bring those experiences here, I feel like that makes a difference because it's helping companies get off the ground. It's helping somebody else chase the dream. They're going to go raise money. They're going to get to hire people that just like our team that lives their dream, getting to do what they love it, go out because they can go fishing in the afternoon or whatever it is. Um, you know, I, 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 I find a lot of uh, reward in that and, and also uh, getting to help promote some of those companies too. So if you're, you know, kind of forgetting my own parameters, but roughly I try to stick to Kentucky or at least the Midwest or South. Um, if you are, I think it's like sub million dollar run rate. If you're a founder, you can apply. It's founderfires.com. I take very little information. I will not sign an NDA, uh, but you know, 90 minutes we can chat and I will answer any question you have. Um, and I give you the last one I did. I think I had 11 pages of notes when it was all said and done for his, for everything. So Wow, that's impressive, especially for that time that you're giving with that. I show so. up with like, I'll, I'll usually try to help with the pitch deck because that is probably like one of my personal strengths is building. I mean, the creative side, like design wise, that's something a lot of founders struggle with, especially a technical founder. Um, if you haven't hired a designer, a lot of decks look like shit. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and like, it matters. Let's not act like it doesn't matter. I mean, although LinkedIn's Series B deck is still one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. Uh, but unless you're like, LinkedIn, you know, I think it helps to have good visuals, but also there's a lot of other things I catch because I've heard it. I've had investors tell me all this stuff. So, um, you know, that's a big part of it. That's why there's so much on the notes feedback is it's a, I rip your deck a new one. It's like, I, I go through and I, I the headlines, the, every, the, you know, you don't need this slide. You need this slide, take out this. Um, and it's all, you know, it's, it's free. So you get what you pay for at the end of the day. All right, so founderfires.com. All right, so we're getting ready to pivot here into rapid fire questions. You gotta be careful when you say that around my team. That's oh, you know, that's a good point. So, so really quickly though, before we do that, one of the things I wanna share that you commented on here, Brad, is that a lot of these events when they're evenings and things like that, folks that have kids, it's hard to show up to these things. It's very difficult because of schedules and stuff like that. So just a big shout out to Kiana and Larry Horn. We met a couple of weeks ago about what them sponsoring us for 2022 and 23 looks like. And one of the things they talked about was finding a solution for childcare for our event. So I wanna let you know that we've heard them, we've heard you all. So that's something that we're working on so we can get more and more people to that. So it's just interesting you brought that up as a reason why some people can't come and we're trying to solve that problem. So, all right. 
At the end of the rapid fire questions, we're going to be going into Q&A. So we've got plenty of time if you've got specific questions about anything Brad has talked about or his story that you want to ask. So we'll go through and do that. Austin's got a mic where he'll be roaming around and going through and do that. My so. kids, it's like an hour and a half to two hours before bedtime. So we got to go past that. <laughs> I, I, I got to get out uh, the jail free card tonight, so I'm here all night. That's awesome. That's <laughs> fantastic. Okay, so rapid fire questions. It, usually these are going to be just one off answers, really quick off the cuff. And we've got a list. You're of picking up that I have a hard time doing that, I can tell. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, you do like to talk. You're the one that said it, not me. So these are meant to be just single word answers. And all these have been selected out of a list of about 500, specifically for you, Brad, specifically for you. So for the first one, Apple Watch or Samsung products? Garmin. <laughs> you, you know, I do have to give Brad props. I've had an Apple Watch since they first came out. I now have a Garmin on my wrist. I got it yesterday for my birthday, and part of it was because of the conversation I had with this guy. So I didn't know that was going to be your answer. I actually didn't throw Garmin in there because I wanted you to pick between the two, but went off road on me there. Yeah, Apple's advertisements are like, do you like charging things every night and they break easily? <laughs> okay. All right, here's the next one, and I think I actually already know the answer to this one based on a previous conversation we'll had, we had, but we'll see what you say. Jeep Wrangler or Ford Bronco? Bronco. Okay. Mountains, beach. Mountains. Compound bow, rifle. I have so many questions of like, but we'll... Rifle. Okay. Turkey, black bear. Turkey. Pizza? Yes. Steak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gmail? Yes. Office 365. Gmail. East Coast, West Coast? East Coast. Man, he's doing good at this, isn't he? I mean, he's seriously, <laughs> I was trying to trip him up and... I studied. This, Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. So final question, and this is a big one. I think we know this too, but we just need to see where your loyalty lie. And this is a really tough one. Wildcats, Cardinals, or Hoosiers? Go Cats. <laughs> All right. Very good. That was fun. We love doing just, that because you just never know exactly what those answers are going to be. The Louisville rivalry doesn't exist where I'm from. Oh, really? No. We don't talk about Louisville. It's like... <laughs> It's Tennessee or Kentucky, and I grew up on the right side of that debate, so. Got it. Okay, well, there we go. It, Our, it's also Eastern Kentucky, and I think, like, the Louisville rivalry bounced back in, like, the 80s, right? Like, when I grew up, we didn't even know about it yet. Because Mark Twain says that when the world's going to end, he's going to go to Kentucky because it's 20 years behind. Like, we hadn't even heard yet that it had come back, I think. So That's funny. That's funny. All right, time for Q&A. So it looks like Kiana's got the mic back there. So if you've got a question, just raise your hand and Kiana will make her way around to make sure that we can answer that question. So it looks like Lisa's got the first question. Oh. Hey, how you doing, Brad? Hi, Lisa. All right, here it is. How did you know when your company had hit the point of scale, when you were actually then a scalable startup? What did that look like for you? I'll tell you at that two-year event uh, that we're talking about doing. I'm joking. Uh, sorry, that was like really flat joke. I'm sorry. I feel like embarrassed about it. Nobody laughed at all. Uh, we, Lisa, we, uh, the thing that Zach and I have monitored for forever are looking at the unit economics. What are we acquiring them for? What are they worth? And, you know, pre-pandemic with advertising, uh, it was a numbers game. And it was just, you know, and everybody warned us about that going into it, but we felt confident with the, um, the climate on, on the other platforms that it was going to get there quicker than it really did. I also, like that's a big, if you're doing anything similar to what we're doing um, from the tech side, I know a couple of people, I don't know what your tech is, it could be anything, but you know, I think uh, a lot of decks I see that people think they're going to grow at this astronomical pace because they looked at the Airbnb decks and all this stuff and you're just, you're not coming out of Y Combinator most of the time. You're not. Um, you're not getting the advantage here that a lot of those companies do. And those, I think also people don't realize like the, a lot of that is blink of the eye. Like it's, it's magic, right? There's something special happened there. The world aligned and 
for your company, it might take just brute force to, to get there. So uh, one of the things, just as advice out of that question, is to just know that whatever you, and Zach and I still project this way, whatever we think it is on the revenue side, let's cut it down. Whatever the expenses are, jack them up. <laughs> it's like, that, that's a lot of like our strategy on planning. Through the advertising days, um, I don't think we'd, we never really got to the point to where we, we thought it was gonna scale. Now, it's within the last six months, we've started to see that path to profit, profitability um, in, in seeing like, hey, this can, this can happen. We can get cash flow positive, uh, but, but it takes someone like Zach, not me. That's the, again, I, I really, if you're not complimenting yourself with founders who can um, handle, you know, I, I thought, I mean, I did a lot of the financials embarrassingly enough with, with some mentorship before Zach really got involved in it. Um, but, but, you know, a mind like his, he just works a lot differently than I do, but just to the answer of when within the last six months, we've started to see that, that goalpost, uh, and actually know when it is. Cause usually as a startup, you know, you're just always like, well, this time next year, I'll be unemployed, right? Like that's, that's kind of the life we all live, um, when you're in the early days. Uh, but, but right now we're, we are, you know, um, we're really to a point where we're tweaking and, and massaging and you know pulling levers a little slower than we used to. Uh, you know we used to like cowboy style kick open the doors and onto anything we did, and now it's a lot more refinement um, for the most part. Excellent. Another question? Let's see. We got a few of them back there. Hey, Brad. Thanks so much. Um, I know as a founder, you often wear a lot of different hats, and so I'm curious. Kind of from your perspective, are there any um, things that you had a hard time letting go of or releasing control of? And then also, are there anything that you still do on a daily basis that you're like, I should have delegated this a year ago? Maybe because you enjoy it, maybe because you just have a hard time letting it go. I feel like Braden in his head is really interested in this question because Braden, uh, Braden's our growth specialist. He handles, he drives a lot of our content and I still get assigned to write stuff right now and uh, I'm, copywriter by background. I don't write about toilets anymore, uh, but um, I still do a lot of the content. Not a lot. Um, I do content for us, I should say. Uh, Brain's like, yeah, not a lot. Uh, but I think for me, that was mine. Like that's my, that's within my wheelhouse. Um, there, there are, as a founder, you're going, you're going to be, I, I feel like, um, let me back up. There's two ways to answer that. There, there are people who raise money and they say, how many people can we hire and have six months of runway? I'm not that guy. There are a lot of founders that do that. And I have friends that do that. And like, I, went, I went up and met this guy one time for drinks. Uh, I was traveling. I was like, how's it going, man? And he's like, dude, I got two weeks of runway left. I'm like, why are you here? <laughs> you, should be, you should be pitching right now. He's like, it's 9 o'clock at night. I was like, I don't give a shit, right? Like, you need to be out. So Zach and I don't do that. If I told you he like would save a dollar, like we're both like Dan made fun of me yesterday because one conversation in the same hour, I said three hundred dollars was a lot of money, and the next like forty minutes later I said it's just three hundred dollars, no big deal, right? Like you should always like until you're in my opinion cash flow positive or, or like te uh, um, Uber level funded, you should be that way. Uh, there there are considerations though, and we will spend money if the juice is worth the squeeze. And that's like, I can't tell you guys how to think through that. Um, I still write content because I like it. It keeps my face on the brand, which people resonate with because we're not a faceless um, social company. And I enjoy it. So, but there, there are things that we pay people to do now, uh, like as man managing a Zen desk or something that's just, it's not busy work, it's just stuff that's gotta be done. And I think if you're doing something that's gotta be done, you don't enjoy it, it doesn't benefit with your customer. Those are the kind of things I would start to look at weeding out. Um, I wish I had a more like well-presented, I could probably write like 5,000 words on this, uh, but off the top of my head, like those are the kind of things I would start to shave off when you're well-funded. But for and t like that first half million dollar round, you should hire, you should be executing seven different hats. 12, I don't know, whatever the number is, but like, don't shave off stuff and cut your runway down so tight that you're my buddy freaking out. He did save his company, by the way. I can't believe it, but he did it. But like, you don't want to get in that position because you will not like the terms that get dealt to you. 
Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so for one comment and one question. So my first comment is like I knew you and Zach when you worked down the street, and Mama's proud. I'm so proud of you guys for what you've built. Um, but also, I wanted to know about like while you're building. You know, we've talked about. Uh, fundraising and, and and getting the money to build this but like in the meantime you've also got to build your user base right your customers and so how do you balance that and how do you decide where to focus and what to focus on and when um it's a really good question thank you by the way uh i think a lot of that depends on what phase you're in when zach and i have uh I'm kind of thinking of all the growth growth hacks we've done. When you're raising money, um, the big money is going to come from people that don't care about the revenue. It, it, for our kind of company, okay? Um, a lot of you are like, oh my God, this dude, I can't believe I sat here for an hour to listen to this guy after saying stuff like that. Like, I get it. That's not everybody's advice. For our kind of company, though, um, when we got to the right investors, and trust me, I spent a long time pitching the wrong people. Um, when I got to people that really understood how to grow this kind of business, they really encouraged us to quit messing around on trying to make money and start trying to grow the platform. And we went from one end to the other for a while. And, you know, we've done stuff that's driven growth, but it's not quality. And it's taken me a long time. I mean, if I said right now, like, would you rather have qual quality or quantity? Everybody would say quality that we all say that stuff. But when you're pitching and you, you're talking to investors who want to see that J curve, um, you know, your ethics get questioned real fast on like what you want to do with that money and how you want to spend that marketing dollars. So in the long term, like what we've landed on is kind of bucketing that growth. We have, um, and this isn't like a formal philosophy. I'm just kind of thinking through how we make decisions. Braden tries a lot of things. Braden's my growth specialist here. He's awesome. Uh, love the guy. We'll try a lot of things. Like we'll throw five, 10 grand at an experiment with our marketing budget now and look at the quality of that. And I wish we had been more thoughtful with that in the past. Um, you know, a lot of, we would blow our whole budget on tests and then not have anything left. A lot of it's because we didn't have any money <laughs> in the first place, like we were raising small amounts. But now we don't commit a big bucket of anything, we, we pilot stuff. And it sounds so obvious, but when you're a startup and you get that juice of like, oh my gosh, we're growing like crazy and investors love the chart and we're raising, like we're raising money. Um, so like it, it can be hard to say no to growth for the sake of growth. And if you know, we're on the left coast, they're going to tell you a whole different thing than what I'm saying right now, but you guys are raising here and I know these investors and there is a point where you got to find that yin and yang with that. Um, I can't answer that. That's like, if I knew everybody here was building a social commerce company, I could answer it a little more, you know, robustly, like find, find people that contribute to both. Right. Uh, but I, my, my long winded answer here is experiment experiment with with a pilot you know throw a little bit at it if it's working and you're seeing quality out of it then you can pour into that uh, we blew a lot of money in the early days throwing um too much at experiments in the you know out of the gate that was a bad answer i'm sorry well i'll talk to you afterwards and give a good one all right any other questions yes sir you're down in the front So you talked about some of your challenges that have led up to this point. What's your biggest challenge you're facing working with today? Supply chain. <laughs> uh, the, it is supply chain. I mean, it's just like screwing us on every level right now. Um, we, we, I didn't really get into the weeds of like what we are, but we, we do not, Im our goal was to not inventory a lot of product. I have a warehouse that's like barely bigger than the stage that Dan has optimized the hell out of. Uh, I'm not really exaggerating that much right now. Um, but because we drop ship, we, we are the lowest man on the totem pole for every manufacturer we work with. And so um, we, we are, are doing like an unreal amount of our revenue for what we thought we were gonna do when Dan came on board last summer. Uh, you know, poor Dan is like the most overpaid warehouse guy in the city, I guarantee it, because we can't keep up. Like we've had to hire some help and. Uh, we're doing way more volume than we projected, and we hope it's temporary. Um, but the supply chain, I have learned so much since August of 2020 about how everything impacts everything. And, and so um, right now, we don't really see that getting better until next year in our industry. 
some of our brands are telling us like they're canceling like we'll have orders come through and like oh yeah we canceled that shoe yesterday we don't make that anymore and it's like thanks for telling us you know uh and so a lot of it's just been supply chain but a lot of it's building the data feeds to be accurate with that you know it's uh we we operate out of a lot of different systems we integrate into shopify woocommerce big commerce direct with some we're moving into edi so there's a lot of different uh avenues that we get information and it's just been really hard with the cha changing supply chain because like without warning our brands will just stop selling something that we're selling to customers so that part's been tough and are you compensating by building up your warehouse? yeah we have to because like if, like we one of our probably i don't know dan probably our top five products right now we can't drop ship because they won't let us so like why sell the uh, why drop ship to us when they can make more money and they don't have to ship it selling to a retailer so uh right now what happens is amazon comes in and just buys everything uh, uh, or or bass pro is getting really sweet deals because they'll buy in bulk so we have to try to compete with that and get inventory um last august i placed an order for a, a, a camera for hunters and it didn't show up until january like that's just what we're dealing with right now we could have made uh, don't quote me on this, Patrick. This is not a formal presentation, but like we probably could have made 30 to 40 percent more revenue last year if we just had product. All right, we got time for one more question. Any more I said all questions night. out there? All night. All night. Well, when we're done, there's plenty of time for questions in your team. Yes, down here in the front. Hi, um, I would love to know about the side hustle that you shouldn't have told your boss about. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> I did tell my boss about it. This is a long story. I'll, I'll, I'll you be got clear. all night. Uh, huh? You got all night. All night. That's right. Well, that's um, <laughs> so really as quickly as possible, I was a social media manager and, or whatever. I, again, I don't remember my title. I was managing social media communities and Zach was a, I don't remember his title leader. He was a data guy looking at me, marketing uh, media for the, the accounts we have. And one day at lunch or something, I'm complaining. I'm like, dude, this is just crazy. Our, our clients, like, they want to promote this stuff that make, looks like no sense at all. I feel like they're just shooting from the hip, guessing at stuff, and uh, which, again, like, maybe, maybe that's what running a company is if you listen to me ramble for an hour and five minutes. Uh, but, like, we, we thought it was crazy that we, we were planning this giant marketing campaign for this company because they saw a commercial and were like, hey, skinny stuff is in, pop, uh, in, in uh, trend right now. Everybody's talking about skinny pop and skinny this and that. So we're going to do skinny products. And we're like, what? And it, it, later it bombed. It totally bombed, right? And, but Zach and I were talking about this. And I'm like, how is no one using data to inform their marketing? And he's like, well, nobody talks. To, the marketing team's not getting the data. They, you know, there's no discussion happening there because we were very siloed. And so we started, the more we talked about it, I'm like, well, we should do something about this. And, and so we started working on a company that would look at restaurant data and find um, trending products. Like, what is your best customer? Is your best customer a Sam Adams drinker? Then why do you have Bud Light in the commercial? You should draw your best customer, right? Like, to be able to basically build algorithms to find that kind of stuff, um, really, we were talking about machine learning before I even knew what machine learning was. Um, and to, you know, we, we had all these ideas. We're like, yeah, and then we could know that, uh, you know, you could look at this app and see that a restaurant was really busy on that night or this one wasn't if you wanted to go out on Valentine's Day or the menus could change with the weather because we know that when it rains that people don't buy that product. We had all these crazy ideas and it was all based on data. And so... Zach and I started working on this. Funny enough, Jacob, who's here with the uh, mustache over there, uh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jacob, I was like, we need a sales guy. He's the only one I really knew uh, well enough to ask to do this. So the three of us started meeting for beers. We had like an operating agreement. Zach had screenshot some stuff he had done at this agency and show, to show Jacob what he could do. And we were like, I don't know, six meetings deep into this organization, founding this company. And we had mentioned it to our bosses and it got awkward and um, we were just like, whatever, we're going to do this and roll with it. Company starts not doing well. Zach gets laid off. They go through his Dropbox. They find the operating agreement. They find the screenshots and they asked me about it. And they said, this is great. Why didn't you tell us about it? And I said, because you would have fired me. And they said, that's so silly. We might be interested in using this. And then they fired me three days later. Um, <laughs> 
So the lesson there is either be better at lying or just be truthful. <laughs> I ended up going to another company and out of the gate in my first interview, I said, I just got fired for a side hustle. I don't know what it'll be. Maybe this thing, maybe not, but I don't want to get fired again. Are you guys cool with me doing whatever I want with my time? And they said yes. And they actually, um, the CEO of that company invested in Go Wild when I left. So, Wow. How about that? What a story. Let's give it up for Brad. Big hand. What?